uh, to this uh, work, wait, okay, this meeting is, okay. Okay. to this workshop on relational quantum mechanics. Uh, we just wanted to actually uh, give you a five minutes introduction to the workshop and then to etiquette of the workshop, nothing boring, I promise. So um, this started, I mean, th th the idea of the workshop started out because um, Christian and I uh, worked on, another, on, on, a, on a paper on relational quantum mechanics and then Andrea, uh, so the three organizers work on relational quantum mechanics and realized that there was a renewed interest in actually in relational quantum mechanics on the one hand, but on the other hand, um, especially in the philosophical community, when the philosophical community uh, starts talking about um, you know, in, uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics, they usually still focus on, you know, Bohmian mechanics, uh, collapse theories, and uh, variety of quantum mechanics. And we didn't understand why, uh, you know, we shouldn't include um, other interpretations of quantum mechanics into the discussion. And so we thought um, to have a workshop, uh, in particular with, on relational quantum mechanics, a workshop with philosophers and physicists uh, to talk about this, uh, this interpretation because we thought it was, um, unfairly neglected, at least in the philosophical community. And this is because, I mean, um, as, as you probably know, since, since you're here, right, relational quantum mechanics offers new uh, answers to old questions, like to, to old quantum riddles, like, you know, the reality of the wave function, some take on Wigner style paradoxes, and so on and so forth, and also raises actually important uh, philosophical um, questions of our own, right? I mean, how does it relate to other broadly, let's say, relational interpretations, such as, uh, for example, perspectival interpretations championed by Dennis Dix. I think that Richard Healy signed up, has kind of a relational interpretation. David Mermin, for a, for a long time, had a relational, kind of a relational interpretation called, the, I think, Itaka interpretation, and so on and so forth. So we decided, actually, it was time that um, we, we all got together and discussed about this, and we reached out to Carlo, and Carlo was not just kind, he was, was really supportive of the idea. So we thought, okay, we're gonna, we're just gonna do uh, an entire workshop on this. And then uh, this, this is the part in which I say, after being rejected at least once. <laughs> um, so we thought, okay, we're gonna do it on, your, on our own. And it seemed it paid off because we're 84, 85 people. So I'm not just gonna just shut up now. <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> And um, so I, I really want to thank, uh, so we need to thank uh, some institutions. So for example, the, um, the SNF, which is the funding board in Switzerland, uh, Chris has to thank this thing, which is incredibly difficult to read. So I'm going to read it. Like, okay, some information is fueling colloids, whatever, from the University of Grenoble. Um, and we want to thank, uh, most, most importantly, we want to thank the speakers for having accepted our invitation. And of course, Carlo, which actually will be with us for, for the entire workshop and he will give us his reply in the end. So it was, um, uh, thanks, thanks so much. Uh, now, so this is all for introduction and just need a, a little bit of a Zoom etiquette, which is, so we're gonna have four talks, which are gonna last like roughly half an hour, 30 minutes, 30-ish minutes. So we're gonna, then we're gonna have 15 minutes for Q&A and then we're gonna have five minutes for break in between each talk so that we can go to the bathroom, you know, get a coffee, whatever, and it's not. And then um, after that, uh, Carlo will, um, will, will discuss the papers, we'll discuss uh, any, any other aspects of relational quantum mechanics, and then we're gonna have a general discussion. And, um, and that's it for now, right? Th then I'm gonna share the discussion, but this will come later. So the first speaker is um, Andrea Aldofredi from the University of Lausanne. And Andrea, can, can you share your, your slides with us? Yes, so is of it, course. Is, is going to talk about the relation between a famous theorem in the foundations of quantum mechanics, known as the PBR theorem, and relational quantum mechanics. You can see the slides. So, Andrea, take it away. I'm going to tell you when you are at 25. And yeah, guys, sorry. So that you can. Sorry, Claudia. Wait. Yes. Go first, ahead. Yes. Uh, yeah. Sorry. It's very to to. The tiny thing. Um, so first, uh, uh, we also should uh, thank the FQXI, uh, for, at least from my <laughs> perspective. Uh, and second thing, we were supposed to start at two. So since people are still oh. coming in, I don't know, uh, it's up to you, but uh, if you want to, I don't know, what do you want to prefer, what do you prefer, if you want to wait or start a bit earlier? Um, I just want to uh, point out that we should, uh, maybe people are, uh, coming in the next five minutes so 
by the way, so one last thing, even that we have time. We we kind of, we are recording this. We should have should have we asked earlier actually. And yes, uh, so uh, speakers, uh, which are all here, Alexia, uh, nice see you, Mauro, uh, Pierre, and so on. Uh, so we are going to record the meeting, if you agree, mm -hmm. and post it on the uh, YouTube page of the QANG, which is Quantum Engineering Grenoble, and also probably on other pages of our uh, websites. Uh, so um, I hope you, you can uh, please tell me um, that you agree. It yes, we do. No, I do. I have Mauro, I have Matteo, Andrea, Pierre. Yeah, it's fine for me. Fine for me. Okay, Carlo. Good. Okay, Alexia. Uh, we can't hear you, Alexia. Well, at least we found a way to use five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, well, um, uh, Alexa, stock will be late, so later. So for now, yeah. No, I'm sorry for interrupting you, Claudio. No, 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 no need to be sorry. Uh, so I, I think we should start right now. So once again, Andrea, I'm, I'm going to tell you when you're at 25, and and then you'll take the time that you need. Okay. Perfect. Take it away. Thank you. So many thanks, Claudio, for the introduction. Uh, I warmly thank everyone for being virtually here, uh, especially Professor Rovelli for having accepted our invitation to discuss his theory today. Uh, in this talk, I will be speaking about uh, a paper that I wrote in collaboration with Claudio. And uh, in this text, we try to answer this question, does the PBR theorem refute relational quantum mechanics? Um, more precisely, we investigate uh, the tension that seems to exist between the epistemic conception of the wave function psi in relational quantum mechanics and the pusey butter rudolph um, theorem, according to which all quantum models reproducing the prediction and statistics of standard quantum mechanics must be psi-ontic. Um, um, this paper has a twofold aim. On the one hand, we um, we want to dissolve the tension existing between the theory and the theorem, showing that uh, these two can peacefully coexist. On the other end, we want to show that uh, kind of PBR type theorem uh, cannot be derived in a relational setting. This is the outline of the presentation. In the first part, um, I will introduce very generally the theory, relational quantum mechanics, and then I will speak about the PBR result starting from its foundations namely Harrigan's second distinction between psionic and psi-epistemic model. And then I will say a few words about the theorem itself. The central part will be devoted to um, explain our argument uh, in favor of the peaceful coexistence between RQM and the PBR theorem. And in part four, I will explain our motivation against the relation PBR theorem, and then I'll conclude. Um, as you know, relational quantum mechanics has been proposed by Carlo Rovelli in this paper, appear on the International Journal of Theoretical Physics in 1986. Um, of course, there are much more recent presentations of the theory, but for the purposes of the workshop and for this talk, we can stick to this foundational uh, essay. Um, let me say, um, let me give some background uh, motivation that uh, led um, Carlo Rovelli to introduce the relational quantum theories. Uh, of course, uh, research in quantum gravity, because this theory, one cannot rely on a background, space time, or arena where to locate things, because the fundamental items of the theory uh, create it or reproduce its salient feature. Um, so that this theoretical framework provides a relational concept of space-time. Then uh, we can see that um, relational quantities are ubiquitous in physics. Uh, one of the usual examples that Rovelli uses is that uh, is the notion of classical velocity, which makes sense only relative to a reference frame. And the main project of RQM is the application of this relational character of physics to the formalism standard quantum mechanics taken at face value. Uh, interestingly, Rovelli and Vidotto consider quantum mechanics as a theory 
uh, about the interaction among systems. Uh, they claim indeed that quantum theory describes the universe in terms of the way systems affect one another. Uh, they also say that quantum mechanics is therefore based on relation between systems where the relation is instantiated by a physical interaction. Even more explicitly, um, Rovelli claims that quantum mechanics does not provide an absolute um, observer independent description of uh, physical systems. But uh, what QM gives us is a formalization of properties of a certain system which is always relative to another system which plays the role of the observer. Uh, indeed, he claims that quantum mechanics can therefore be viewed as a theory about the states of systems and value of physical quantities relative to other systems. Even more emphatically, he continues by saying that uh, quantum mechanics state as well as value of a, of a variable or outcome of a measurement are relational notions in the same sense in which velocity is relational in quantum mechanics in classical mechanics. Um, before entering in the inner workings of RQM, let me say um, some, let me state some preliminary remarks. Um, according to Rovelli, the paradoxical feature of standard quantum mechanics are due to the presence of the ill-defined notion of absolute state of a system. Removing this notion, this concept, then will allow us to solve the main conundrum and uh, conceptual problem of the theory. Indeed, um, according to relational QM, the notion of absolute state and thereby even the notion of absolute reality uh, either away in favor of a relational uh, stance. Indeed, according to this framework, the state of a system and of course its properties uh, acquire meaning, so they are meaningfully defined only with respect to another system playing the role of observer. Another crucial remark is that in this theory, every physical object can be an observer. So not only conscious beings like experimenter, philosophers, physicists, but also electrons, um, air molecules, Geiger counter. So every physical object can be an observer. So um, among the, principle, uh, the principles of quantum mechanics, there are several that carry over also in Rovelli's theory. For example, the eigenvalue eigenstate link, the linear dynamics of the Schrodinger equation, the collapse postulate, and the Bonsch rule. Of course, the main difference uh, lies in the interpretation of the wave function, which in this theory is not an absolute description of the um, properties of physical system independent of any observer. Indeed, we can explain the substantial difference between relational quantum mechanics on the one end and standard QM on the other. Um, uh, in terms of the main observation of RQM, which says that distinct observer provide different description of sequences of physical events, and such description are equally correct and do not generate any contradiction. Um, this main observation of rela uh, relational QM uh, is deduced um, by, from the third person problem. I try to uh, represent graphically this physical situation considered by uh, Rovelli in his, um, in his paper. Uh, here, suppose uh, in, uh, in a room we have an observer O, which is going to measure a two-valued quantity A, suppose A can take values of one and two, and before the measurement of A, S, our system, is in a superposition of state. Then, after uh, the performance of the measurement, O finds this state here at time t2. Suppose another observer p, uh, and therefore another perspective, uh, knows that O is going to measure the quantity A on the system S. So at t1 before the measurement, S is in the superposition and we have a correlated state of the observer O pointing in a neutral direction because um, she doesn't know which outcome will be obtained. And then in virtue of the Schrodinger evolution, which is linear, we obtain this final state here at time t2. Uh, from this example, we uh, can see some very interesting consequences. For, uh, first of all, that physical events can be described generally uh, in a different way by distinct uh, observers. 
Uh, even more importantly, that such diverse description are equally correct and non-contradictory. Um, of course, we have to assume that quantum mechanics is complete self-consistent, and this uh, leads us to the conclusion that the relativization of states um, expresses an ontological feature of reality. So it's not that we have this different description because of lack of information of some observer. So this relativization is not epistemic, it's uh, ontological. Um, other metaphysical implication of relational quantum mechanics can be um, expressed. For instance, the demarcation between the observer system and observer is not univocally determined. Indeed, if we think about the third person scenario, observer O um, plays the role of the external observer um, in his perspective. However, according to P, O is part of the observer system. Uh, here, exactly as in a theory of relativity, um, there, there exists no privileged observer. So every system, as we said before, are, uh, is on a par. Um, from an ontological point of view, uh, it is often said that relational quantum mechanics implements an event ontology. Uh, this, these events are observer-dependent changes of values of physical quantities that occur when physical systems interact. Uh, other metaphysical, uh, very relevant metaphysical implication of quantum uh, relational quantum mechanics is that IQM is not a theory about the behavior of the wave function in space-time. Uh, in this uh, theoretical framework, Psi is just a, for, a formal tool, a convenient um, mathematical object that we use to compute probabilities and refer to some uh, to the information that some observer has relative to a system. Um, therefore, here in our QM, the wave function is not interpreted realistically because it does neither represent the properties of physical system nor concrete object in space time. Okay, so we are ready to uh, move to the PBR result. Uh, let me say something very briefly about uh, Harrigan Specken distinction. Uh, because in this paper, Einstein in completeness and the epistemic view of quantum state appeared in foundations of physics, uh, we, um, we find a very interesting uh, classification, which is useful uh, to define the nature of quantum state. According to Harrigan and Speckens, um, they are able to provide a categorization uh, telling us whether the quantum state represents properties of physical system or just knowledge. Um, this will be useful, as I already said, because uh, uh, such distinction um, is employed by PBR uh, as a fundamental assumption of their, of their theorem. Um, Harrigan and Speckens uh, frame their approach um, in an operational setting. So they consider operational quantum theory and ontological models. So here, ontological has a very weak sense. Um, Harrigan and Speckens means uh, just that uh, quantum models refer to something real in the world, and they call this something lambda. Um, but of course, they are not interested in specifying the metaphysical details uh, about these quantum models here. Um, the ontic state, on the other end, um, is said uh, to provide a complete specification of the properties of a certain system. Um, Harrigan and Speckens distinguish quantum theories in psionic, and a model is defined psionic if lambda can be described by a pure quantum state. So in psionic models, different quantum state correspond to this joint probability distribution over the space of ontic state, as we can see from this picture here. Um, even more precisely, they say that a model is psionic if for any pair of preparation procedure, P psi one and P psi two, associated with distinct quantum states psi one and psi two, we have that the product of this probability here is zero for all lambda. On the contrary, they say that a model or quantum theory is psi epistemic if lambda is consistent with more than one pure state. In this case, uh, there exist quantum states corresponding to overlapping probability distribution, as we can see in this region uh, here, delta. 
Um, in this case, of course, the, the, the product, these probabilities here will be different from zero. Um, two very easy facts about this distinction. Cypistemic model cannot be symbiotic and vice versa. And this is the relevant fact for us. Um, Hurricane Speckens claim that in cypistemic model, the quantum state provides just uh, incomplete knowledge of reality. So it does not refer to a reality in itself. Okay, uh, the PBR theorem uh, is a, one of the most uh, important result uh, in quantum foundations and has been uh, derived by Pusey, Barrett, and Rudolph uh, in this uh, and appeared uh, on Nature Physics in the in this paper on the reality of quantum state uh, published in uh, 2012. Here, the authors uh, established that epistemic interpretation of the quantum state cannot recover quantum prediction. Um, they say, and I'm reading, uh, if the quantum state merely represents information about the real physical state of a system, then experimental predictions are obtained that contradict those of quantum theory. So, uh, we know that the, this theorem uh, rests on several assumptions. For, for the purposes of this talk, we, we mentioned just uh, these uh, three. So, preparation and dependence, according to which it's possible to prepare physical system in a way that their ontic state are not correlated. And then, of course, um, Harrigan and Speckens distinction is employed, and also measurement response, um, which merely says that if the quantum systems are independent, then measurement will respond uniquely to the properties of the system that is being measured. Uh, the hypothesis of the theorem is that quantum states represent knowledge. So um, we start from um, this very simple fact, we consider epistemic state. So according to the hypothesis of the theorem, quantum states do not represent reality. So here we are considering the physical situation pictured in, um, in B. As we saw before, there is an overlap between these two probability distributions so that lambda is not univocally determined by a quantum state, but it is consistent with both psi and phi. Okay, uh, let me sketch very briefly and roughly the proof of PBR theorem, the main reasoning behind, behind this result. So we consider two different preparation procedures, P psi and P phi, which corresponds to the state phi and psi, which are taken to be non-orthogonal. Uh, then we choose a Hilbert, a basis for the Hilbert space such that psi is equal to this vector here and phi is equal to the plus vector here. Of course, as we already said, psi and, uh, and phi are taken to be epistemic state so that there, is, there exists a positive and finite probability such that the preparation of either quantum state will result from the overlap region delta. And now we consider two systems, S1 and S2, which uh, are not correlated. And then each system, S1 and S2, um, can be prepared by an agent such that its quantum state can be either psi or phi, can be compatible with both. Importantly, the agent doesn't know um, in which one um, a state is prepared, although, of course, she has information about the preparation procedure. And consequently, we have these probabilities here are not zero. Uh, this is just to remind um, everyone the um, experimental setup considering the PBR um, theorem. We have two systems prepared uh, using two copies, the preparation device, and they are prepared independently, and they are sent to this measurement device here, and they form a complex system here, and the properties of the complex system will be revealed by this measuring device, and of course, the property of the complex system will depend only on the state, uh, on the individual state of the system composing it. So, sending the system uh, S1, S2 to the measuring device, as we said, 
we form the complex system S12. Interestingly, the physical state of such a complex system is compatible with any of these possible uh, quantum state. And since, of course, the, the ontic state of S12 is compatible with all of them, we can write this set of probabilities here into. Now, we proceed and measure the system 1, 2, and the observation uh, project the system onto the following state, chi 1, 2, 3, and 4. So, here, algebraic manipulation shows that uh, whatever outcome will be obtained, chi 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, it is certain that it will eliminate uh, one of the possible tensor product state um, in one, so that we have this set of equation here. But in this case, quantum mechanics implies that these probabilities are zero. This is to say that for every measurement direction that we saw before, we can find the state of the complex system that is orthogonal to it. And this leads to the desired contradiction. From this fact, PBR said that starting from epistemic states or epistemic conception of quantum states, we derive a contradiction. So, by reductio, um, they say that quantum state cannot be epistemic. Okay, so uh, now it seems that uh, there is a tension between a relation of quantum mechanics on the one end and the PBR theorem on the other. Um, indeed, according to Rovelli theory, uh, psi is epistemic. And we just saw that the PBR theorem establishes that. Um, an epistemic view or an epistemic conception of the quantum state cannot reproduce a standard quantum mechanical prediction. On the other end, we know that RQM is uh, in perfect empirical agreement with quantum theory. So the question is, how can we dissolve this tension? In order to answer this question, um, it is useful to take into account the implicit assumption that Harrigan and Speckens um, made about uh, the nature of lambda. So according to them, lambda has to meet the following assumption. First of all, intrinsicality. According to their classification, a quantum object instantiate intrinsic properties, uh, which can be revealed through, me uh, through measurements. Uh, and lambda, of course, is determined by these intrinsic properties. Um, secondly, uh, they assume perspective independence. So the properties of a quantum system uh, do not depend on the perspective of a given observer. And finally, uniqueness. So complete description of the intrinsic properties of a quantum system can be given only by one choice of the wave function. Indeed, in cyontic uh, in models, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between lambda and psi. Now, it's easy to see uh, that in relation to quantum mechanics, these assumptions are violated. Indeed, the ontic state of a physical system always depends on the perspective of a given observer. And a physical system thereby are represented by relational states because the values of their properties are observer independent, as we have seen in the third person problem. Um, Indeed, different observer might ascribe diverse wave function to the very same lambda. Think about the example of O and P. And um, it is important, very important to underline here that these different wave function don't represent incomplete knowledge. They reflect the perspectival and relational uh, nature or relational ontology of physical systems. Um, even more, we can say that in Rovelli theory, psi is a relational object as well, because it is associated to a relational lambda. What is very crucial for our argument is that even though it's possible to ascribe to, uh, um, to the same system a multiple wave function, such wave function do not fail to capture some absolute or observer independent properties of physical system. Therefore, we said uh, in our essay that Harrigan spectrum classification um, does not have 
um, the necessary formal and metaphysical requirement and resources to deal with uh, relational quantity states and relational uh, wave function. As a consequence, this classification cannot be easily applied to quantum mechanics. But since uh, this classification is the foundations of a PBR theorem, uh, but we, we cannot use to, to, um, you know, to classify relational quantum mechanics, we can conclude that RQM does not lie within the scope of the theorem. And more generally, even more generally, it's not true that every cyclostatic model contradicts the predictions of quantum mechanics contrary to uh, what PBR claim. Okay, um, I have six minutes more, so uh, I will be very fast here. Um, in the last section of our paper, we ask whether it's possible to find the relational counterpart of the PBR theorem. Uh, if the previous section can be seen as a kind of critique to the um, assumption of Harrigan, uh, concern, the assumption concerning Harrigan's second distinction uh, between cytostemic and scientific models, here this section can be seen as um, a focus on the, the assumption with, that, that we call measurement response. Um, in this uh, relational PBR um, theorem, we consider two protocols, uh, P psi and P phi, which correspond as usual to uh, quantum state phi and plus. And of course, we uh, take them as epistemic. Now, we consider two systems, S1, S2, prepared by uh, an observer S, which, as usual, uh, is using two copies of uh, the preparation device such that the quantum states can be uh, compatible with either psi or plus. As in standard PBR um, scenario, even though S knows the instruction on how to prepare system S1, S2, they may not have complete knowledge of lambda. However, following relation to quantum mechanics, um, S1, S2 will acquire a particular ontic state relative to the observer S, so that we have lambda 1 relative to S and lambda 2 relative to S. Of course, given our initial hypothesis, we can use this probability here. They are, of course, different from zero. Uh, after the preparation, uh, suppose, as required in the standard PBR, scenario that uh, we send, that S sends um, the system S1, S2 to um, another device, to a measuring device, and then the system, the complex system S1, 2 is formed. Here it is important to note that the composite system is given by the product of the independent physical states of the individual systems that forms it. Um, we know that uh, this is not a meteorologically trivial fact, but of course we have to accept this, this fact for, for the sake of the argument. So let's assume that the ontic state of the complex system relative to S is compatible with the tensor product states of one, meaning that it is compatible with the state uh, up, up, up plus, plus up, and plus, plus. Um, so that relative to S, the complex system um, can be in one of these states, and therefore we can obtain the relativized counterparts of two. So this set of equation here that we called A. Um, now we measure the complex system S12. However, according to the measurement response, the measurement device as star which in a relational context is different observer with respect to S, will respond solely um, to the properties of the complex system S12. However, as we know, the crucial question in a relational scenario becomes the properties of S1 relative to what system? Here, we can answer this question looking at the graphic representation of a relational PBR setting. So in this context, we have our observer S that uses two copies of the preparation device, and then he obtains state of the system S1. So we have lambda 1 relative to S and lambda 2 relative to S. And then he or she sends 
the systems to another observer as star, which is going to measure uh, the complex system as one too. However, it is worth noting that these two observers are different and that also the ontic state of the complex systems are different with respect to observer S and a star. Now, uh, the measurement system, of course, will respond to the properties of S12 relative to S star, which is, uh, and of course, we can say that um, we can represent the, the ontic state as lambda 1, 2 relative to S star. Uh, but as I already said, it is crucial for our argument that there is no guarantee in a relational context that the ontic state of the complex system um, should be equal from the perspective of S and the perspective of S star. In general, on the contrary, um, these ontic states will be different and therefore uh, no contradiction will arise between these two different descriptions. Um, this means that if we suppose that the relativized counterparts of equation five hold true in this relational PBR setting, so suppose that according to um, psi st uh, to S star, these probability are zero, we don't have any contradiction because of the difference in the relativization targets of S and S star. Uh, therefore, we concluded that uh, one cannot derive the same conclusion of the PBR theorem in a relational setting. Concluding, uh, there is no tension between RQM and the PBR theorem. This is the main conclusion of, the of our essay. Um, and this is so because one of the assumptions used to prove this theorem uh, cannot be applied to relational quantum mechanics. So uh, we also claim that it's not correct to say that the PBR theorem refutes every epistemic theory, or if you want alternatively, not every epistemic theory is a contradiction with the prediction of standard quantum mechanics. And finally, we show that the relational counterpart of the PBR theorem uh, cannot be derived. So this concludes uh, the presentation and many thanks everyone for your attention. Okay. Join me in thanking Andrea. Thanks, you've been right on the spot. That's wonderful. Uh, th this is what you know ears in Switzerland do. Um, so you, you get really right on time. The time was precise. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I mean, spending a few years in Switzerland is paid off. It's always <laughs> useful. Yeah. So let me. Okay. So let me let me remind you how how the uh, Q and A session works. So write in the chat Q for question and F for follow-up because you're way too many. I cannot see you all. And uh, so I see someone wrote already two messages. So Mat Matteo, you are first and I'll, I'll, and I'll monitor the chat. So please write Q for question, F for follow-up. Matteo, you're up. Uh, I think Daniele had a um, comment. Maybe you want to oh, yeah. read it first. Yeah. yeah, sorry, sorry. Yes, Daniele had a comment saying no, that- okay. so is <clears throat> is not a question i don't shouldn't have priority i was just pointing out that uh, matt Lefer in his uh, review paper uh, points uh, to exactly the same uh, fact that uh, the the pbr theorem simply does not apply to any of the psi epistemic but not realist uh, in the hidden variable sense uh, interpretations of mm -hmm. quantum mechanics and includes the uh, relational quantum mechanics um, cubism uh, uh, helis uh, perspective uh, and I don't remember if there were others but uh, it's simply they do not uh, they cannot be phrased uh, in the Harrigan's Peckins uh, framework and so the PBR yes. theorem simply does not run I mean you cannot oh. even start uh, it's not that it violates a specific assumption it just it's not does not refer to this type of interpretation yes um, thank you for this comment uh, there is also another paper showing that even the statistical view, uh, the statistical interpretation of the wave function uh, does not lie within the scope of the theorem. Um, but uh, with Claudio, we wanted to show specifically why uh, these uh, former result, which is, you know, very important quantum foundation, 
uh, does not apply specifically to AQM. And we wanted also to say a little bit more uh, by showing that uh, a PBA type you know, result cannot be achieved in a relational setting. Indeed, I have to say that I show the simplest case uh, in, in, in the slides, because of course I have time limits, um, but in our paper we consider more complex scenarios with multiple observers. But of course I agree with the comments and... Uh, but, but in fact the very interesting point is whether one can devise a, a, a relational version of uh, Harrigan's Peckins uh, framework. Yes. And then one can yeah, check if there uh -huh. is an analog of the PBR theorem. Yes, yes. Um, this is also a very important point, so thank you for pointing this out. And uh, Andrea, I'm just seeing that Philip also notes that it's important for us. It's, uh, even uh, PBR actually states in the introduction that the underlying assumptions uh, will not be compatible with our interpretation, so we should actually should actually remember that. Thanks, Philip. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether you want to say a few words about this. Otherwise, I'll jump to Mattel. No, I mean, it was really all I wanted to say, but I mean, it's like on paragraph three or something like this. So it's, they're kind of very clear um, in, in that paper about that. So. Um, so Matteo, I think I have you now. Yeah, uh, thank yeah. you. So I have a question of clarification mostly, which is probably connected. Uh, so if I got it correctly, your argument is uh, that um, to reconcile epistemic RQM and the PBR theorem, um, you need to argue that three assumptions are violated, namely intrinsicality, perspective, independence, and uniqueness. While it seems to me that you only need one of these being violated. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. And, and uh, I would, and, I, and it seems to me obvious that, well, obvious. I would say that it's natural to claim that the second assumption is really what counts. Perspective dependence means that a property is not intrinsic. So you. you all the work is really done by um, extrinsicality in terms of perspective dependence. Uniqueness is sort of a red herring, I would say, but maybe I'm wrong on this. So this is the question. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't say that it is a red herring because it's a central point uh, in a Harrigan and Speckens distinction between, uh, you know, cypostemic and psionic because um, you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between lambda and psi. So uh, what is interesting in relational quantum mechanics is that it's not true that you have, you must have a one-to-one -one correspondence. So for a, for a given sequence of event or, or a given system, you can associate multiple wave function. So this is, I would say quite relevant uh, for our purposes. Oh yeah, my point is that you get it for free if you have perspective uh, yes, dependence. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So even intrinsicality is obvious yeah. if you have pers perspective dependence. So that, that was my Yeah, point. but you know, we wanted just to um, point out what is implicit in sure. uh, Oregon Speckens. And then of course, uh, as soon as you violate it, you violate one, uh, the rest comes for free. Yes, uh, just for you know, completeness of the presentation, we, we decided to mention all of them. Yeah, basically, I feel you get a stronger dialectics if you only need one of the um, assumptions to be violated. So it's uh, just a rhetorical point. Yeah, I know, but very useful. Okay, yes. Uh, th thank you, Matteo. Can, can I, even then, yes, no, I, I think you're completely right. Meaning, like, I think in, in the paper, actually, we show the, the following, right? We show that if, um, if every... Basically, if you have relation, right, then you use, for example, land abstraction to, to actually build properties. Now you're gonna be you're gonna be guaranteed that you get extrinsic properties. You're not gonna get intrinsic one. So so of course, um, unless you have a very weird theories of intrinsicality. So from you know uh, the perspective dependence, you really get just extrinsicality of every property, and, and therefore so that's that's what we do. Yeah. Um, good. But, but thanks. Yes, we should should underline better in, in the paper. Uh, I'm, I'm taking notes, by the way, Andrea. So you don't you don't have to worry. about Great, it. Claudio. <laughs> so you got to follow up. You got Ippolit and then Mauro. Ippolit, yeah. Right. So thanks. So it's uh, a quick follow up. Actually, it's even a, a question rather than follow up. But so it might be just a question of semantics. But don't you think that 
at the end, maybe we should not call uh, quantum variational mechanics subside epistemic theory, or maybe so, or maybe there are two two different notions of play epistemic yes. because of course there is a play epistemic for the ontological model of Aragon and Spekins, but uh, like Liefer said and Daniel pointed out, every New Copenhagen interpretation like Cubism, uh, uh, Carlos uh, interpretation, Bruckner interpretation do not fit in this kind of ontological models. So you yeah, are they, 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 they right. have some kind of epistemic notion interpretation of the of the type of the wave function but it's completely different from the ontological one so so you are totally right and this is exactly uh, um, so you are totally right and this is exactly what i uh brought with uh, my colleague christian lopez uh, in another paper um which was about uh harrigan speckens distinction and we say exactly this um, in this paper with Claudio, we wanted just to show that these alleged um, tension can be really easily dissolved. So, um, but it's true that uh, also the question rests on the, you know, ambiguity uh, on the definition of what is psychopistemic in a relational context and, of course, in Harrigan and Speckens distinction. So, Claudio, do you want to add something? Or, uh, no, I'm just copying and pasting all the comments that we have. So then we. <laughs> and so, the, so the comments that Jack just put it in uh, in the chat is actually what I was aiming for. So okay, it's ah, not psi epistemic, but it's probably broadly epistemic or like, yeah, maybe neo Copenhagen or Copenhagen. Okay. Or, so I didn't read the comment. Uh, so uh, it's um, yeah, I mean, it later actually distinguishes between broadly epistemic but not psi epistemic. So we just should mention that in the paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. And I, I think you had another follow-up slash comment by Mauro. Mauro, you're up. Yes, thanks for your talk, Andrea. Very interesting and thought. Um, provocative. Um, provocative. Basically, my point, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, no, basically my point is a follow-up um, to Daniela's observation. Uh, it seems to me that the problem is that their approach to this psionic a view of the theory is really weak. Namely, they don't, they don't ever say what do they mean, what, what they mean by, by psionic. Is this psi an evil, a field that evolves in configuration space? Uh, well, no. Uh, I mean, what maybe the conclusion that there is a compatibility here is that they never really clarify what this psionic. Uh, view really amounts to so it's not a, it's not a strong point of view basically it's a very weak realism uh, um, first of all thank you for this very important comment i would say that uh they harrigan speckens i mean they can answer by saying that um this sort of weak realism is sufficient to to show their point because they don't want to to say what the wave function actually is or the quantum state actually yeah. is, because they say we move, we frame our approach into an operational context. So that the primitives uh, in, in their approach are preparation, procedures, and measurements. So uh, if there is something physical in the world, then there is a one to one correspondence between this ontic state or lambda and psi. Otherwise, if this lambda is compatible with more than one state, this state represents just knowledge. So the, 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 I, I would say the strength of, of their approach is this generality, because they say we don't need to specify the you know, metaphysical details of lambda or psi. We just want to be as general as possible in order to provide a, a very broad classification. But of course, I think that, uh, you know, from a metaphysical point of view, one may require more if you want, you know, to actually distinguish also in a metaphysically strong sense. Yeah, know, different interpretation of the wave function. Because we don't know what the theory is about, basically. I think Rovelli's Carlos approach is more realistic than uh, than mm -hmm. we are. 
to a certain extent, yes, events. There you only have preparation, so. Yes, yes, but, you know, uh, let me be the devil's advocate. Um, they, they would reply that we, we don't really care about the details, about what there is. Uh, the important point is that if there is something, then it must be in one-to-one -one correspondence yes, between yes, yes. Psi and Lambda. Otherwise, the state is just uh, knowledge, information, does not refer to anything. And we want to, to leave unspecified the details of this anything or something. Uh, of course, I believe that uh, RQM is a realist theory. Uh, although this, um, I, I, I try to put forward uh, a realistic interpretation. I mean, <laughs> realistic interpretation uh, is um, maybe um, an exaggeration. I, I, to provide some argument saying that RQM can be interpreted you know, in a realistic manner as we do with Bohm, JW, and Everett. So I consider yes. RQM as realist as the other ones. Yes. Of course, this type of realism is um, not naive and of course uh, needs a lot of philosophical work to be done. But I, I, I agree, I agree with the, the heart of your point. Thank you. Thank you. Good model. Okay, so we still have a few minutes. Now, Jacques posted a YouTube link on a talk with Martin Lafer. Thank, thanks, Jacques, again. Um, and uh, given that we have only one question left, I think, G Gia, you're up. Um, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Um, so I have, a, I have a more of a naive uh, a question and more of a philosophical question. It seems this discussion clearly brings out that there are diff different ways for a theory to be epistemic. And uh, the question is, uh, as, as a student, I, when I learn RQM, the thing that confuses me is uh, like, what, what precisely is the meaning of epistemic for RQM? For, for, for Argon Specken's perspective, that's clear to some extent because uh, there we say a size is a, a state of knowledge that's about incompleteness. There's something underlying it. There's a lambda, and if there's no one-to-one -one correspondence, that means my knowledge is limited, and and that is clear. But but see, I can ask the same question: uh, In what sense is uh, RQM epistemic? And that's not so clear to me. Right. So I think that there is a person who is better entitled to answer this question here. <laughs> but I try to uh, say something. Um, at least from my understanding of uh, relational quantum mechanics, uh, contrary to the case of standard QM, the wave function doesn't represent uh, the absolute state or the observer independent state of a physical system. So it does not provide you know, the complete information um, or absolute information about the physical. Uh, it is always observer dependent. So since it depends on the observer, different you know, observers can ascribe different wave functions to, these, uh, to the same object, as we saw in the third person scenario. So psi, of course, describe the state of, the state of knowledge because, uh, of course, of a given observer. If you try to imagine uh, RQM in the Heisenberg picture where the state just um, withers away and you have the physics lies in the values of physical quantities, then you have a um, kind of rough similarity with, with RQM. So uh, what is real, what, is, what, what has ontological weight are the eigenvalues of, or the values of physical quantities and they change with respect to uh, the interaction that occur among systems and of course with respect to the different perspective um, that we are considering. So this, the state, the wave function, is just, um, you know, uh, it, it provides what a, a given observer, a given, um, you know, yes, a given observer, a given agent um, knows about uh, a certain system. 
in, in this sense, I, I, I would say that uh, relation quantum mechanics can be defined uh, as an epistemic approach to quantum mechanics. That's it. But Sorry, you, you, have, you, know, you have a follow-up from Daniele, but you have to be quick. Daniele. Uh, just to point out, I think that you have to be careful in uh, stating that the wave function doesn't contain the complete, uh, doesn't encode the complete knowledge about the system. Because the, in my understanding, one radical point about relational quantum mechanics, and in fact, all this neo Copenhagen uh, interpretation is that uh, there's no such thing as the complete yes, yes, knowledge yeah. of the system mm -hmm. or the complete reality of the system as if it was something that then observers success. The reality is the collection of uh, the relative uh, information, or relative knowledge that different observers have about each other. Yes, that's, and, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise yeah, yeah, yeah. you would be exactly in the harrigan Peckins framework. That yeah, is, uh, I was not precise. Uh, otherwise, it's really like there is a reality there, and then there is partial knowledge. Right? Yeah, so no, no, no. Of course, state. reality is uh, observer dependent. Okay, I think you know we we, we kicked things off. Thank you so much, Andrea. It was great. Yeah. Thank uh, you, everyone. Uh, I mean, join join me, join thank me, you. thanking Andrea again. And, thank, thank you, everyone. Uh, so let, let's take a five minutes, a three minutes break. <laughs> I, I, I'm becoming Swiss too. <laughs>